from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working with students and families to improve college access and student success for a better West Virginia. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. Good evening, I'm Andrea Lanham at the Capitol Building in Charleston, and this is the Legislature Today. Thousands of teachers again showed up here today to protest low salaries and rising health care costs as their work stoppage entered a third school day. The marble halls echoed with their loud songs and chants as lawmakers met in floor sessions this morning. Legislators face a key deadline in just two days. Wednesday will mark day 50 of the session, a day commonly referred to as crossover day. This is the last day for a bill to be passed out of the House in which it was introduced. If it doesn't make it out of the House of Origin, the bill is effectively tabled, short of some extraordinary measures. This rule does not apply to the budget, salary, or supplemental appropriations bills. So while teachers are demanding their focus, lawmakers are entering the most hectic period of the session. We'll update some of the health bills we've been following this session later in the program. But first, senior reporter Dave Nisich joins me for the latest on the teacher work stoppage. Dave, what's the latest? Well, uh, we heard today, just a few hours ago, that the teacher uh, work stoppage will continue through Tuesday at least. Um, the American Federation of Teachers West Virginia and the West Virginia Education Association made an announcement with the West Virginia School Service Personnel Association. Uh, they jointly rallied outside on the Capitol steps a few uh, hours ago. Um, Dale, uh, Christine Campbell made the announcement. Dale Lee echoed that announcement. Uh, we also heard from Cecil Roberts of the United Mine Workers of America. Uh, so a really big day out there, huge crowd, lots of energy. Um, and again, the teacher work stoppage continues tomorrow. So. And just like you said, we had heard from Christine Campbell, Dale Lee, and a lot of the other union representatives as well. Right, and, and that rally took place on the Canal Boulevard side of uh, the Capitol. We were out there today. We have a some shots of outside during that rally, and we'll take a look at that right now. The leaders in this building can get our students back to school where we want to be. The nation is watching. We are 55 United. And we still say, do your job. We're here for the kids we teach, and more importantly, for the kids of tomorrow. Make no bones about it. We've made it perfectly clear from the beginning what we're here for. It's not one single issue, it's four. And we've made that clear. It's not only our health insurance, it's the pay, but it's also the respect and taking away the seniority and those things have to go. We're gonna grab each other's hands, the person on either side of you, and we're going to make one continuous commitment to everybody in this state that works for a living.
And Dave, the West Virginia Board of Education was supposed to be making an announcement sometime today. Yeah, we haven't yet heard uh, the state superintendent of schools, intendant of schools, Dr. Stephen Payne, had uh, spoke with uh, superintendents around the state on Saturday. Um, they said that they would be making an announcement today about whether or not there were to be an agenda item added to the Tuesday meeting of the state board uh, to discuss legal matters in terms of this work stoppage. As of this point right now, we haven't heard that whether or not that agenda item is going to make it to the uh, to the discussion uh, tomorrow. But we're waiting to see what happens. It's I'm, I'm guessing that based on what happened today, we're likely to, to hear a discussion about what legal implications of this might all come down to. So, and the governor was elsewhere in the state today. He's been conducting three town halls. Uh, one was in Wheeling earlier this morning. That's right. He also went to uh, Martinsburg as well as Morgantown. Uh, he actually, at the one in Wheeling this morning, called for a special session dealing with co-tenancy. Uh, we'll take a little bit of a look at what he spoke to uh, the people of Wheeling this morning. And you missed one thing that I've already told you. Co-tenancy is already passed in the House. And you know what we got for it as far as additional severance? Zero. 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 I didn't want that to happen. Zero. If two truck cars, you've got co-tenancy and you've got joint development. Now, I'm going to make a lot of people mad at me today, a lot of people mad, but I am telling you, I am telling you point blank, where you can be of benefit is don't let co-tenancy pass in the Senate. Don't let it pass. Absolutely make us go to a special session on gas. On gas. Now, just listen. Make us go to a special session on gas, and then in turn, give me the opportunity, if we succeed in that special session, to get a higher severance tax, give me the opportunity to be able to fix your PEI. How, how we make you? Make them. If you don't, if you don't pass co-tenancy, if, if co-tenancy does not pass in the Senate, I will absolutely promise you I will call for a special session. I will put on the docket exactly, exactly why we're there, and that is to figure a solution for your property rights, to figure a solution of co-tenancy and joint development, and to figure a solution of. What has to be tied to that is a raise in the gas severance tax and figure out the, then what portion of that raise needs to spin back into underpin PEI on a permanent basis. That's what I'll do. So the governor being elsewhere in the state has prompted a few reactions from other lawmakers. Right, and uh, we've, we've heard a lot lately. There was a story from Jake Zuckerman of the Gazette recently that talked about justice whereabouts over the course of the session. Um, all sorts of people have been wondering, especially on a day like today when thousands of their teachers have shown up at the Capitol, where is he? Uh, why did he have to go elsewhere in the state to, when he could have just showed up at the Capitol? Um, Senate Minority Leader Roman Prezioso spoke on the Senate floor today about the governor uh, and his trips around the state today. The governor was holding a town hall in Wheeling, and he told a room full of full teachers that he supports working on a bill that gives relevant raises and, and, and benefits uh, to teachers, to service personnel, and to public employees. Now, the, he also said, and I'm going to read some things into this, 
that the House passed over House Bill 4268, which is the code tenancy bill. And it's in our Judiciary Committee now, and we're working on it. And the governor said he would hope that this Senate kills that bill, and we would come back in and look at both co-tenancy, lease integration, and gas severance taxes. Well, the governor, after 48 days, has finally come to the realization that we do have a crisis, and we do have to you know, make some, some progress on this situation. And um, we have 12 days left. He said he, we should come back in a special session. Well, Governor, we'll invite you to the Capitol. There's 12 days left. Let's try to make a good faith effort to, to, to address this crisis and get it behind us. We welcome the Governor to the Capitol. Thank you, Mr. President. And of course, we'll be following this story in the days ahead. We turn now to focus on some of the specific bills that are making their way through the process and others which may not be getting out of committee. We'll get an update on the Opioid Reduction Act and several other health care bills. But first, Kara Lofton reports that while West Virginia has the highest opioid overdose death rate in the country, research shows tobacco kills more than four times as many West Virginians as does opioids. And the passing of even moderate laws to limit tobacco use in West Virginia is a difficult sell. Outside of a 4th Avenue bus stop in Huntington, Ronnie Stone is smoking a cigarette. She started when she was 15 and has been smoking for 35 years. She says she's tried to quit about four times but was only able to last for about a week before the withdrawal symptoms made her light up again. I've done it for so long, it's just that craving. I mean, I hate how it smells, I hate how it looks. Uh, I'm the only smoker in my family. It's an addiction, it's what it is, and it's an addiction to nicotine. I told her that the West Virginia legislature is considering a bill that would outlaw smoking in the car with children under the age of 16, and asked her what she thought. She says she fully supports the idea. They shouldn't have to breathe what our habits are. Environmental exposure to tobacco products, passive or secondhand smoke, is unhealthy for infants and children. Senator Tom DeCubo is a pulmonologist and the lead sponsor of the bill. Uh, you know, I just read an article to the Senate that, that showed or compared uh, just five minutes in a car with someone smoking is the equivalent of the damage and the inhalational injury to the lung that a firefighter would experience four to eight hours of continuous firefighting in a large wildfire. Takubo says while it has a lot of support from groups such as the March of Dimes, American Heart Association, and American Lung Association, other members of the legislature, particularly those in the Liberty Caucus, oppose the bill, saying it limits individual freedom. Takubo, a Republican, says he understands that perspective, but thinks it goes too far in this case. I'm one of those that believe people have the right to make decisions for themselves, but uh, what I would like to see is a dramatic decline in smoking. I would like to see more people spending Christmases with their loved ones. I'd like to see children growing up without having to suffer effects of shortness of breath and asthma because of their parents' choice. He says he doesn't know many smokers who like the fact that they smoke and that many have tried to quit but couldn't. It is very addictive. Uh, it's more addictive than heroin in, in animal models. At Marshall University, Dr. Brandon Henderson is studying the neuroscience of nicotine addiction. We look at specific neurons and regions of the brain that are altered by drugs of abuse. He says he hopes their research will provide information for future regulations that may help prevent another generation of lifelong smokers. When you compare different drugs of abuse, cocaine, amphetamines, and then compare them to nicotine, there really is similar change in the amount of dopamine that's released. Henderson says one of the main differences between nicotine and opioids is that tobacco is a legal drug. Although it has many health impacts, they take a long time to show up. Finally, unlike opioid abuse, culturally, smoking is both prevalent and accepted in much of West Virginia. But changing the culture is difficult. Bills like Takubo's aim to start small by limiting the exposure of children to secondhand smoke. While Takubo's bill addresses children's exposure to secondhand smoke, 
advocates also hope any anti-smoking initiatives go towards changing the culture of smoking acceptance in the state as well. For Appalachia Health News, I'm Carol Lofton. More than 20% of all state expenditures in the governor's 2019 budget bill are allocated for health and human resources. Joining us now are Senator Tom Takubo and Senator Ron Stallings, both doctors and both members of the Senate Health and Human Resources Committee. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thanks for having us. Thanks. So before we get into the Opioid Reduction Act, which is a big piece addressing the number of patients who get prescribed opioids, let's talk about some of the bills that both of you have supported and sponsored. One of them is Senate Bill 61, which was just featured in Kara Lofton's report, and that was sponsored by you, Senator Takubo. And this prohibits smoking in motor vehicles when a minor 16 or under is present. Is that making its way out of the Senate this week? I unfortunately don't believe it is. It, um, it's been in judiciary and we were hoping to get that through uh, but to, to my knowledge, I'm not sure that's going to make it through the agenda this year. Now, Senator Katugubo, you've also sponsored Senate Bill 473, which requires insurance coverage for a smoking cessation drug. And that passed the Senate. Is it, is it making its way through the House? Uh, I'm not for sure. They were probably clearing House bills just like we were clearing Senate bills, so I'm hoping that'll have traction. Um, you know, that's been a, um, a big problem for a lot of my patients is um, that particular medication, even though I don't like to legislate, for specific any any medication, but there's the only one in that class and it's the most effective to get people to quit smoking. And unfortunately, a lot of our people in the state have not had access to that. So we need every tool in the toolbox to try to help these people kick the habit. And there's also a bill raising the legal age to 21. Oh, Senator, Stallings. Senator Stallings. Yeah, it's uh, called T21. It's a, a nationwide movement. Uh, we know that uh, the older you are before you try an addictive substance, the less likely you are to uh, become addicted. And it just makes sense. I mean, every patient that we see, uh, no one says, boy, I'm glad I started smoking. You know, in fact, every one say, boy, I wish I'd never stopped, started smoking. And, and again, that, thanks to the Freedom Caucus, frankly, uh, never saw the light of day. And same thing with uh, Senate Bill 61. So that one's not making it out of committee? It never was considered. And it was referred to the Judiciary Committee instead of the Health Committee. Gotcha. So let's talk about the Opioid Reduction Act. The centerpiece is a provision placing limits on the initial prescription of opioid medications. Now, both of you supported an amendment to preserve the practitioner's decision-making authority in determining medically appropriate care. The majority leader was the one who originally changed that section in the Judiciary Committee. Can you speak to the importance of that measure? I'll start with you, Senator Stallings. Well, again, the, the whole bill, we want to turn the spigot off if we can on uh, opioid addiction. Uh, part of the folks that are addicted now got started with uh, legitimate uh, prescription. And again, some 20 years ago, uh, there was felt that we were under treating pain and we started using more opioids uh, and uh, we didn't realize how addictive they were, frankly. Uh, and so this is an attempt to really turn the spigot off, but at the same time, allow um, people that have pain, uh, legitimate pain patients, if you would. Uh, yeah, I to should mention that that's the bill for the Senate, <laughs> just in case people are wondering at all, but go on. Well, again, to, th there's people out there that are really hurting, and, and uh, it would be very difficult for them to not be able to receive their pain medicine, and studies have shown that uh, in many cases, people that are being prescribed these medicines and are stopped all of a sudden go to illicit drug use. So it was a tempor temporizing measure to the bill. Now, Senator Takubo, this bill addresses patient treatment moving forward, but it doesn't address care for current addicts. Does this happen in other bills, expansion of treatment and prevention measures? Well, I believe what this bill really tried to do was um, work. The, the drug epidemic has to be uh, fought on many, many different fronts, and, and this particular one was really trying to address um, over months and months of research and meetings through interims uh, how do you keep people from really getting uh, addicted at the, at the first place? Now, the other thing is, is that um, it also addressed uh, patients that do have chronic pain that, that primary care is out there uh, treating. And there has been this mindset um, that has really been unfair to people with, with um, chronic pain, uh, that it's almost preempted providers to not treat chronic pain. And so, what we tried to do with this bill is um, go by the data to cut off new prescriptions so that, um, uh, you know, grandkids or other people doesn't have that bottle of, of medicine laying in the, 
the medicine cabinet that was never finished in the first place, cut those way down to prevent those new prescriptions. But at the same time, we did some things in this bill to, to ease regulation a little bit so that um, people can be treated uh, more fairly. And, and there's this um, uh, kind of stigma about patients that have chronic pain and as physicians get older, retire out and leave, um, these people are left holding the bag, which I think promotes probably the heroin problem. And so um, we've tried to address all this as much as possible in the bill. Now, Senator Stallings, you are sponsoring Senate Bill 332, allowing the DHHR to regulate local health departments and establish clean syringe exchange programs. Now, this is one of the tenants in Dr. Gupta's state opioid response plan, and he pointed out to the program last month that the data shows in other areas of the country where you have clean syringe exchange programs, a significant percentage of these folks will accept treatment. Absolutely, and this needs to be a robust statewide system, which is what that bill tries to do. We have a pilot in Huntington, the Cabell Huntington Health Department has done a tremendous job and we can take that data and transfer that to the entire state. Uh, there is a percolating... Is this bill going to move along though? You know, it, to the degree, I'm not sure it will. Again, uh, it allows rulemaking in, uh, you know, Gupta's office uh, to, to make this statewide. Uh, so. I'm not sure if it'll get out, but at least, you know, we can do it perhaps through some policy measures uh, that would not uh, actually codify it or put it in statute. So Senate Bill 431, the equivalent of House Bill 4001, that passed the House and this requires the DHHR to implement work requ requirements for SNAP applicants. Where is that bill right now? I know it's in the Senate. Uh, I think it's in the Health Committee. That, that bill's currently in Health and probably will move within the next week. And you had sponsored a bill similar to that. I should mention that as well. That's right. And that's, is that going anywhere at all? I think so. What, what we're trying to do there is uh, place the focus back on able-bodied individuals with no dependents, with no um, uh, psychiatric or other mental or, or physical impairments that, um, to, to give back to their community. We're, we're, again, this is in no means uh, any way of trying to uh, demean any individual. What we're trying to do is um, get them back into the workforce. There's a lot more to be said about a job other than a paycheck and that is um, the pride of, of not being dependent upon the system. Um, and we understand too that there's lots of limitations. We're a very rural state and so you go down to Mercer and Mingo and some of these places they, they may not have transportation. There may not be jobs to be had and so uh, we said you know help your community, help uh, service centers train for jobs. We, we really really opened that up probably more than any state in the country um, to try to encourage uh, these individuals to, to go back and give something back to their communities. Now Senator Stallings I understand that there's some cardiac and end-of-life programs as well. You know, uh, I tried to get funding for the Center for End-of-Life Care, the Cardiac Project, uh, which is uh, in, in the uh, smoking cessation program. It was through excess lottery. There's not going to be any excess lottery. Uh, I, it was basically to shine a light on it, uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, through the budgetary process, we'll be able to fund these three very important programs that, again, will help bend the health cost curve uh, for, uh, you know, on tobacco and obesity and those things that we know impact uh, healthcare costs. And again, it could help be a long-term fix for PEIA and Medicaid costs, things like that. And it is an investment because it could save the state millions. Every one of those programs, uh, can, if you invest 150,000, you can save 43 million for the Center for End-of-Life Care. Uh, the cardiac uh, uh, project, which basically is a school-based health program, uh, can save uh, tens of millions, if not billions of dollars in future obesity costs, which basically are $2.4 billion per year to West Virginia. And again, the tobacco cessation program, which had about a 30 or 40 percent success rate, uh, can save uh, lots of money for West Virginia. Now we only have about a minute left. Are there any bills that you would really like to see passed here this week? Yeah, I think the stroke designation uh, bill uh, so that you basically equalize care throughout all of West Virginia so that every mom and pop or grandfather or grandmother can get excellent stroke care anywhere they present, uh, even in rural West Virginia. What about you, Senator Tukubo? The stroke bill is important. American Heart Association also has a uh, bill that will be running. Uh, it's a House bill. 
um, that better defines uh, CPR instruction for individuals. So when they're on the other end of the phone right now, 911 operators uh, don't necessarily have to have that instruction. And so what we're trying to do is really promote good education so that uh, they can they can better serve uh, an individual on the other end that uh, is under a very stressful situation. Well, that'll have to be the last word. Again, right. thank you so much for joining. Again, we have Senator Ron Stallings and Senator Tom Takubo. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. This concludes the legislature today. The pace is really picking up here now. Follow all the action in the House and Senate starting every morning at 11 a.m. live on the West Virginia Channel. Coverage of the sessions are then repeated in the evening beginning at 730. Again, that's on the West Virginia Channel. I'm Andrea Lanham for West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Thanks for joining us and have a great evening. Thank <laughs> you.